While the international community turns its focus to Israel's war with Hamas, Russia is pounding Ukraine with ground and air assaults. The most massive offensive actions since the beginning of full-scale invasion. Plus, could Russia have sent Hamas Western weapons it captured in Ukraine? The weapons that have been captured to date by my sources are that that is the case. And that's but not only my sources from the Middle East, but also from um, a U.S. government. And later in the program, why the International Olympic Committee just suspended Russia. Today is Friday, October 13th. From the Voice of America, this is Flashpoint Ukraine. Good evening, I'm Lori London in Washington. While the world turns its attention to Israel's war against Hamas, Russia has been launching some of its fiercest onslaughts of air and ground assaults since its invasion in February of 2022. I got an update from Anna Chernikova in Kyiv. So Anna, a fourth day of intense fighting in this biggest offensive by Russian forces we've seen in months. They are pummeling the East Ukrainian town of Adivka. What's the latest that you're hearing? Well, again, Yes, actually, it's the fourth day in a row that uh, the city of Abdivka in the Donetsk region is getting this super intense uh, attack, super intense shelling. Uh, Abdivka is famous uh, for its location, of course. Um, a lot of a lot of people here in Ukraine um, call it uh, kind of a, a gate to the city of Donetsk. And if you look at the location, uh, it's well, it's understandable. So a lot of experts and especially military experts and people uh, who who understand military well, um, under, uh, also saying that Avdivka has a, quite a strategic meaning both for Ukrainian and Russian forces. Uh, it is under Ukrainian control and Russian forces are kind of trying to, well, first of all, uh, shell it and destroy uh, the uh, the logistics. Uh, but at the same time, um, it, it looks like the Russian forces are, are trying to get through and to move forward and get uh, control of Avdivka. However, the latest what we're hearing from the local ad military administration representative, uh, there are reports that situation is very tough, uh, but Ukrainian forces uh, remaining uh, in, in the area and Ukrainian forces keep control. The head of the Avdivka city military administration, uh, Vitaly Barabash, uh, reported that actually this shelling, which is happening right now, in his opinion, is the most massive offense actions since the beginning of full-scale invasion. Also, what we understand from the recent updates from that area is that Russian forces are getting a lot of equipment in there and manpower in there. And also the attack is happening not all, only on the city of Avdivka, but also in the surrounding area of 20 to 30 kilometers. President Zelensky also mentioned this situation in one of his latest speeches. And he said that Ukrainian forces are holding their positions in Avdivka and that that this is an extremely important area as a front line at this point, and Ukrainians will protect it and will not let Russian forces in. So this is what the latest we have from there. Um, and what are you hearing about the reports that Ukraine ha struck a Russian missile carrier and a patrol ship in separate attacks this week involving seaborne drones carrying experimental weapons. We are hearing this information. Uh, again, I will just point out that we do not have any independently confirmed information or any official comments on that. However, we're hearing reports both in the Ukrainian media and also in the international media. And from basically it's coming from a Ukrainian security service and Ukrainian intelligence that reportedly Ukrainians' latest attacks on the Russian Navy was done with the use of the experimental weapons, which Ukraine is working on. Also, this information was getting public some time ago, but again, no one really confirmed it uh, officially, of course. But uh, what we're hearing that this uh, experimental weapon is actually getting its way through and uh, has certain success. Ukrainian sources also saying that this is just the beginning and that uh, this weapon is a developing process, so uh, we might hear more 
on that. Anna Chernikova reporting for VOA from Kyiv. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in Israel for meetings to discuss America's security assistance. At a joint news conference with his Israeli counterpart, Austin was asked about U.S. support for Ukraine. And we remain fully able to project power and uphold our commitments and direct resources to multiple theaters. So we will stand with Israel even as we stand with Ukraine. United States can walk and chew gum at the same time. VOA Ukrainian service correspondent Irina Salamko spoke with Philip Carber, president of the Potomac Foundation and assistant professor at Georgetown University, about concerns that Israel's war is overshadowing Russia's intensifying attacks on Ukraine. Obviously, uh, any of the magnitude of the attacks in Israel and given the very close American relationship and the large uh, Israeli diaspora, Jewish diaspora in the United States, States. Those attacks have just an enormous significance and they you know, removed Ukraine off the front page, which it was already a sort of interest was declining and, and put it to the back of the, of the newspaper, if you will, if it's even even, if it's even covered on a daily basis right now. So, yes, it has an impact of stealing the, the coverage. I think, uh, though, there are several other aspects of it that are, that are interesting. There's also concern that given that one of the arguments against sending a lot more aid to Ukraine is that the U.S stocks are running low and the Israelis use American tank ammunition, American artillery ammunition and aircraft bombs and, and parts and so forth for their air force, which is basically all American, that this is going to take up our valuable stocks and also available money. And thus there'll be an argument for less resources for Ukraine. I think that is something that is of concern, but I think it's a short term phenomenon. And when I say short term, I mean right now while everybody's focused on, on Israel. I think the longer term significance of it is actually has the potential of moving quite dramatically to the other side. For example, there are reports uh, that are coming out that American weapons and European weapons have been used by Hamas mm -hmm. and that those came from Ukraine. And Russian intelligence and information agencies are promoting this as, as if Ukraine sold those. That isn't true. In fact, if one looks at the serial numbers of these and the, the forensic evidence will come out, it's just important right now to stop that story before it becomes perceived reality, is that those were weaponry that were captured by the Russians in the early days of their invasion in 2022 when they overran a number of Ukrainian units. Well, the Russians don't have American ammunition, American uh, uh, the type of weaponry that would be consistent, that could be used in the weapons that they, they captured. So it's very natural that other than exploiting them and taking them apart and trying to understand them, that they might want to supply them to a friendly group, which ostensibly takes their fingerprints off the weapons. And that group also can find uh, ammunition elsewhere where in the third world to be used. A couple of U.S. Congress people were mentioning this, saying, oh, Hamas is using U.S. Western weapon, and of course, Russia tried to sell it as like a black market and all the stuff, that they, the messages they tried to impose, like in Security Council <laughs> discussing, you know, like this the Western like supplies of weapon to Ukraine. But Ukrainian uh, intelligence service, they already said, as you said, that like, the, the weapons that was captured by Russian, and then they just gave it to Hamas. According to your information, this is true. And you see, as you said, like using the serial numbers you can really track the this thing it takes a while to track all the serial numbers so so if a let's say a, a tow anti-tank weapons a launcher was captured by the russians they want to give it to the to the hamas when this it's lost eventually because it was an american weapon ukraine needs to account for and the serial number of tow such such and such and such was lost on the battlefield it happens all the time in every battle some american weaponry is lost the more we give the more it gets lost so th that serial number if reported lost and it's easy enough to track, was that a battle? What uh, the date that it occurred? Where did it occur? Did, did the Russians get control of the battlefield after uh, after the, the contact? It, as, a, as a detective project, it's relatively easy to determine the truth of that. It takes a while to do that for any and all weapons that would reportedly have been there. But the weapons that have been captured to date by my sources are that that is the case. And that's but not only my sources from the middle 
Middle East, but also from a U.S. government. Yes, let's wait for the definitive answer after we've had weeks of forensic analysis and look at all of them. But let's also put a stop to that story because it's, it's utter Russian disinformation. Now, the reverse of that story is really powerful because it shows who's on whose side. So Russia, uh, along with or obviously its ally, Iran, have been arming Hamas. So it really challenges. There was a lot that in this incident that challenges Netanyahu's policy, a policy that by himself, admittedly, very cynically, nationalistic oriented. And his argument was, yes, we identify with the slaughter. Yes, we think the Russians are bad. But we and the Russians have a deal over Syria. And we want to, and that, that's in the interest, that's in the interest of, Ukraine, of Israel's survival. So that has to come above human rights, above of siding with the deal, uh, even though it is, Israelis have been the first to always go mass murder, slaughter, shame, shame. And he goes, no, this time it's cold. All of a sudden, his deal with Putin is looking a little, little thin. Not only in terms of Russian stuff, but also in terms of the Russia's relationship with Iran. Not to mention, everybody says this is intelligence failure. Well, the Egyptians are saying, no, we've been sending the Israelis messages that something big was happening for weeks now. Usually, when you look back, famous surprise attacks, whether it was a 73 war, you could work. whether it was Pearl Harbor, famous surprise, the Russian direct invasion of Ukraine in February of 22. The evidence of buildup was all there. It was the politicians who decided not to recognize it for whatever reason. So I suspect when we find the truth of that, it's not going to look well on the you know, government, not to mention his controversial policies with respect to the to the military that have been causing riots in Tel Aviv. And so at the absolute worst time when you really need a united military and a united country. I won't predict what's going to happen to Netanyahu. I think at a minimum, his attitude towards Ukraine and Russia is likely to change significantly. Russian Empire. Guess what that includes? It includes Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, half of, of Eastern, uh, Eastern Poland, Ukraine, on and on and on. The first five of those I just mentioned are NATO members. So when Putin comes to them, guess what? Uncle Sam is going to be up to it to our neck, if not over our head. Some people say, oh, well, we got to worry about, about China. Who is Russia's strategic ally? Ally, who's under financially undergrading the Russian invasion of Ukraine? China. Who's Iran's big supporter? China. So when you put this puzzle together, it becomes increasingly obscene for people to sit there and have their eyes closed and pretend that this is about uh, saving a little bit of money or worrying about domestic problems. And so I think what's going to happen, there is going to be, as a result of this, if for no other reason than because of the attitude towards Israel and the Jewish diaspora, in the United States. You're going to have, instead of having this increasing bifurcation of American politics to the extremes, I think you're going to see on, on coming back together a joint effort for a bipartisan American foreign policy. A foreign policy that is focused on realistically addressing who are the bad guys, who are our friends, and what do we need to do about it. That was Philip Carber, president of the Pacific Foundation and assistant professor at Georgetown University, speaking with my colleague, VOA Ukrainian service correspondent Irina Salamko. Polish voters face a stark choice in parliamentary elections set for this Sunday, October 15th, which are likely to have a significant impact not only on deeply polarized Polish society, but also on the future of Ukraine and Europe as a whole. My colleague Kim Lewis spoke with VOA's Eastern Bureau Chief Miroslava Gungadze in Warsaw for insights on how the results could affect its neighbors in what is becoming a very tight race. It is uh, indeed a very close race. A civil coalition uh, trails uh, the law and order and justice party by just several percentage points uh, in the polls. The law and justice party came to power in 2015 and they are governing Poland for eight years. So it is very logical that a big part of the population um, is looking for change. The opposition is trying to galvanize its voters to come and vote to, to change the government and the civic coalition bloc uh, headed by Donald Tusk, uh, he's 66 and former president of the European Council and the former uh, Polish prime minister, he pledged to revise the judiciary uh, amendment that law and uh, justice party uh, uh, proposed. He promised safeguard media independence and protect civil liberties. The Tusk coalition assert that it will work to restore Poland's international reputation. 
as a democratic nation and rebuild its cooperative relationship with the EU, particularly with Germany, which has faced strong criticism from the current government in the recent months. At the same time, uh, Law and Justice Party are claiming that they uh, fulfilled their promises and are ready to govern one more term. That would be a very unique political situation to govern for three terms. From behind the scene by former Prime Minister Yaroslav Kaczynski, he's 74 now. The party pledged to maintain traditional values and ensure the country's security, especially in the light of Russian aggression in neighboring Ukraine. The analysts say that most likely none of the political forces will be able to win um, outright and they will have to form the coalition with smaller parties if they will uh, enter the parliament. What do the people of Poland want? People of Poland concern about their security and well-being. But they are very divided. And there is 10 million pensioners in Poland. It's a quarter of the population. So they just want to maintain their pensions and have free health care as Poland has. Uh, for the younger generation, these elections are about civil liberties and free choices that they would like to make. Uh, these elections will be uh, critical for the uh, direction of Poland as a democratic states and basically direction of Europe as a whole. The political force that comes out as the winner, what will they have to do regarding the support of Ukraine? According to analysts uh, I have talked to, a uh, civic platform can score, we, we talked about possible coalition, right? So the, the civic platform can score enough uh, votes to form a parliamentary majority in partnership with other forces like Poland's new left. Alternatively, law and justice most likely will form the coalition with far-right confederation party. Initially, due to the war in Ukraine and Russian aggression, there was a rare moment of national unity in Poland uh, with widespread agreement on uh, supporting Ukraine and against the Russian aggression. However, consensus has eroded during this election campaign. The Law and Justice Party, as analysts say, is adjusting its rhetoric, particularly in terms of Ukraine, to feed off competition from the far-right confederation, uh, who are perceived as pro-Russian. Additionally, there is a um, crisis in agricultural imports especially grain delivery in rural areas, uh, which is influencing the ruling party uh, messaging. The member of the current government and a special envoy for Ukraine, um, Yedviga Emilevich, uh, told me in recent interview that at the start of the war, 38 million Poles were standing face to face with Ukrainians and helping them and opening their homes. And today, she said, it does not matter whether Poles will vote for law and justice or civic platform, they feel a bit disappointed and even offended sometimes being treated, as she points, not very seriously by the Kyiv partner. During this election campaign, the support for Ukraine dropped 10%, but still, majority of Poles believe that they have to support Ukraine. And irrespective uh, of the election outcome, as observers say, both political forces share a consensus on the necessity of providing continued support for Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression. VOA Eastern Bureau Chief Miroslav Gungadze in Warsaw speaking with my colleague, Kim Lewis. You're listening to VOA's Flashpoint Ukraine. I'm Lori London. Russian authorities have raided the homes of lawyers representing imprisoned opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Associated Press correspondent Karen Shamus reports. The raids are part of a criminal case in which the three men are accused of participating in an extremist group, according to Navalny's ally Ivan Zhdanov. Navalny's team confirmed on Telegram that all three of his lawyers were detained after the search, apparently as suspects in the case. Navalny's chief of staff said the case 
against the lawyers comes as Navalny is due to be transferred to a penal colony. He added it was unclear exactly where that would be. Navalny has been behind bars since January 2021, serving a 19-year prison sentence. I'm Karen Chavas. Officials say that 90% of the missiles fired into Israel by Hamas were thwarted by its missile defense system called the Iron Dome. VOA's Rick Pantaleo spoke with missile defense expert Professor Dinshaw Mistry at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio to learn more about Israel's Iron Dome and how it could potentially be a useful tool for Ukraine's offensive against Russian attacks. So the Iron Dome is one layer of a multi-layer missile defense system, and it is the layer designed for the shortest range incoming rocket, a range of about 2 to 40 miles. And then there are other layers of missile defense, such as the David Sling and the Arrow, that defend against rockets coming in from greater ranges. So that's the short definition of the system. And what does it do? I understand that it has intercepted 90% of projectiles fired toward Israel since it was attacked by surprise by Hamas. That is right. It has a fairly good interception rate of 90%, and it's been used uh, since about 2012. So Hamas fired rockets in 2012, 2014, 2018, 2021. And in each of those incidents, the Iron Dome intercepted over 90%. Who developed and constructed it? So it was originally developed by an Israeli company, the Rafael Air Defense System. And over the past few years, it's also been co-produced by uh, Raytheon in Arizona. Why and how does the United States fund the Iron Dome? Well, the U.S. funds Iron Dome as part of a defense aid to Israel. And since 2012, we've given approximately $3 billion for the Iron Dome system. And uh, has there been much debate uh, regarding the U.S. support of it in Congress? Yeah, so uh, Congress is fully supportive of the system and in part because it is very effective in uh, addressing the threat of uh, incoming rockets. And if it's such a wonderful missile deterrent, uh, why doesn't Ukraine have access to its use with its war with Russia? So this is a good question. Ukraine has requested it. Israel has held back on supplying this to Ukraine in part for political considerations, its relationship with Russia, but also because it does not want Russia to get a hold of that technology in case Russia captures it in any military operations in Ukraine. Since the U.S. plays a role in its development and construction, does the U.S. have access to this technology? Yes, the U.S. does have access. It does co-produce this. Raytheon co-produces it. And the U.S army has also purchased a few batteries of this missile defense system. And finally, Professor, what is this new iron beam system that's supposed to work in tandem with the Iron Dome? Uh, The new iron beam is currently undergoing research and development. It should be operational within a year, and it is designed to intercept rockets at even shorter ranges than the Iron Dome. So, in fact, it would complement the Iron Dome. Thank you very much for taking my questions to Today, Professor Dinshaw Mistry, a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio. Uh, thank you, Rick. After nearly 20 months of waging war in Ukraine, Russia was suspended by the International Olympic Committee on Thursday. The IOC's executive board imposed the suspension on the Russian Olympic Committee for breaching the rules and principles by incorporating sports councils in four regions illegally annexed in eastern Ukraine. Name Donetsk, Kherson, Luhansk and Zaporizhia constitutes a breach of the Olympic Charter because it violates the territorial integrity of the NOC of Ukraine as recognized by the IOC in accordance with the Olympic Charter. International Olympic Committee spokesperson Mark Adams. The suspension has the following consequences. The Russian Olympic Committee is no longer entitled to operate as a national Olympic Committee as defined in the Olympic Charter and cannot receive any funding from the Olympic movement. Adams said the IOC's suspension of the Russian Olympic Committee is immediate. 
And that'll do it for us today. Stay up to date with continuing coverage of Ukraine and news from around the world, 24 hours a day at voanews.com. And on social media, just follow VOA News. On behalf of all of us here at VOA, we thank you so much for listening. Until next time, I'm VOA's Lori London. Washington, bam, 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 zip, D.C.